This is a Dynamic Network podcast. Hi, and welcome to the Dynamic Duel Podcast, a weekly show where we review superhero films and debate the superiority between Marvel and DC by comparing their characters in stat-based battle simulations. I'm Marvelous Joe. And I'm his twin brother, Johnny DC. And in this episode, we're going to find out who would win in a fight between the artificial intelligence robot characters Amazo and Bastion. Now, if you guys have recently watched X-Men 97, the cartoon on Disney+, Plus, you will know who Bastion is. And if you're not a DC fan, you probably have no idea who Amazo is. Everyone knows who Amazo is. Like, Uh everyone. Okay. Both of these guys are highly adaptable. It's going to be a really great matchup. We're going to input the character statistics, run a thousand simulations, and find out who would actually win, but not before speculating on the match itself. Before that, we're going to break down the latest comic book movie news to come out this past week, of which we have two news items. The first one being that Nicolas Cage is going to star in a Spider-Man War live action series for Amazon. And we got a release date for the movie Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow. As always, we list our segment times in our episode description. So feel free to check out the show notes if you want to skip ahead to a particular topic. Our artificially intelligent dual simulator, AJ9K, has a quick message for our listeners, so listen up. Why, hello there. Do you love listening and chatting about Marvel and DC? Then become a part of the Dynamic Dual community on Patreon, where you can choose from three tiers. The Dynamic 2.0 tier lets you listen to this podcast without ads and gives you access to its Discord chat group, where you can chat with Johnny DC and Marvelous Joe. The Fantastic Four tier gives you that and more with two bonus episodes each month, including bloopers and top 10 shows where Johnny and Joe count down your favorite Marvel and DC subjects. The X-Force tier makes you an executive producer of Dynamic Duel, where every month you help the host choose what to review and who to fight against each other. And finally, the Dynamite Podcast Network tier allows aspiring podcasters to create their own battle-focused show using this Monte Carlo simulator. Johnny and Joe will help you develop your show, provide graphic support and consultation, and get you simulation results to announce on your show. Pitch the twins your show via email at dynamicduelpodcast at gmail.com or by reaching out to them on social media. Check it out at patreon.com slash dynamicduel. Pip pip cheerio. Thanks AJ9K, and thanks to everyone who supports the podcast. Guys, be sure to tune into the shows in the Dynamic Podcast Network this week, including Max Destruction, which pits your favorite action heroes from film and television against each other. The show is currently on its season break, but you can still catch bonus episodes this whole month, including tomorrow's episode where host Scotty reviews Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2 with his brother Gilly. Yeah, I know we said that that was going to be last week. For real, this time it's tomorrow. Yeah, last week they reviewed Conan the Destroyer. On the Sendro World podcast, host Zachary Hepburn speculates on fights between fan-favorite anime and manga characters. This Thursday, we'll find out who would win between Laxus from Fairy Tail and Lambo from Hitman Reborn. And on the Console Combat podcast, hosts John and Dean find out who would win in fights between popular video game characters. In yesterday's episode, they found out who would win in a battle between Jimmy Hopkins from Bully against Naughty Bear. Fascinating stuff. Go check it out. Visit dynamicpodcasts.com or click the link in our show notes to listen to all of the shows in the Dynamic Podcast Network. But with that out of the way, quick to the no prize. A no prize is an award Marvel used to give out to fans. Our version, the Dynamic Duel No Prize, is a digital award we post on Instagram for the person that we feel gave the best answer to our question of the week. Last week, we asked... Which actor wore your favorite Superman suit and why was it your favorite? And this was coming off of the first look that we got at David Cornsweth's Superman suit in the upcoming Superman movie directed by James Gunn. We got only three answers and two of them were the same. So really we got two answers, but let's go ahead and break down those honorable mentions as well as the no prize winner. Our first honorable mention goes to Christopher Minotti, who said, Hi guys, Christopher Minotti. My favorite Superman suit has to be the one that was worn by Brandon Ruth in the CW's Crisis on Infinite Earths. I I really like that one. It's like a combination between 
the one that he wore in Superman Returns and the super suit in Kingdom Come. I, I love the emblem from that one, and I like how this one looks. It's designed very well, and I like him as well. Yeah, it was not a bad costume. I'm a big fan of Kingdom Come, so it was really great to see that suit in live action. I don't remember seeing too many elements from the Superman Returns costume. I actually am not a big fan of that costume, but I thought it was a really good adaptation of the Kingdom Come comic, and it was just really cool to see Brandon Routh as Superman again. Yeah, with the graying temples and everything in homage to Kingdom Come, that was pretty cool. Of course, David Cornsweet's Superman costume has a similar looking S emblem shield on his chest where it's just like the, the diagonal line going across. Right. Except it's not against a black field. Right. It's yellow for corn sweat suit. Great answer, Christopher. Our next honorable mention goes to Colby Henches, who said, Hey boys, Colby Henches. My favorite Superman suit would have been the Brandon Roth CW Crisis Kingdom Come Superman suit. It looks like he just pulled that thing out of an Alex Ross painting and put it on. Yeah, Alex Ross is just a really good costume designer. I mean, Superman suit was cool, but so was like Batman's and Wonder Woman's and just everybody. And not just in Kingdom Come, but like across the board. He has really good like reinterpretations for characters like the Riddler or even like Clayface. Yeah, he's very much a fan of the Silver Age, but I like his modern adaptations of the costumes from that time for sure. I'm interested in all the different ways Brandon Routh's last name could be pronounced. I think we got Ruth, (laughs) we got Roth. It's Routh. (laughs) Honestly, I'm surprised that these two honorable mentions were the same answer. I actually thought there would be a lot more answer submissions for this particular question. But let's go ahead and announce the winner of this week's No Prize, who is Miggy Matanguian, who said, Hey, what's up, guys? It's Miggy, and I'm here to voice the popular opinion on the server in case nobody else does. And that is Tyler Hawkins, um Superman suit and Superman and Lois, and I guess in the rest of the Arrowverse. Um, it's just very classic looking, great symbol, good textures, um, kind of like Rebirth suit inspired, but also just very classic. I don't know, like Silver Age. Yeah, it's a good one. So all TV answers for this question. I expected at least one answer from one of the movies, but, you know, Tyler Hawkland's Superman suit is not terrible there's actually a lot of fans of it i'm not particularly a fan of tyler hawkland as superman in my opinion he kind of looks like a younger version of ty burrell but i also can't (laughs) deny the fact that his suit is really good and i love seeing the different iterations of it that we've had from across you know the various crisis and elseworld storylines that we've seen him in and like his golden age costume they were all really cool Actually, this is my favorite Superman costume as well, Tyler Hawkins, because really uh, not only is it a great like modern adaptation of the Superman costume, I think it's better than Henry Cavill's uh, Superman suit. And I definitely think it's better than the upcoming David Cornsweet suit. So, uh, yeah, I think Tyler Hawkins Superman suit is the one to be, at least in this day and age. I'm trying to think of what my favorite Superman suit is. Honestly, it's probably Christopher Reeves. I know it's kind of dated, but it's also iconic, in my opinion. Maybe if it had a little bit of texture, it would be absolute perfection. But yeah, I think so far, that's as close as we've gotten. What an old man answer. This is an old man answer, Jonathan. What are you, an old man? Kids these days can't tell the difference between just plain old and classic. (laughs) Well, congrats to Mickey for winning this week's No Prize. If you, the listener, want a shot at winning your own No Prize, stay tuned to later on this episode when we'll be asking another question of the week. And now that that's done, on to the news. All right, and a bit of news that was definitely not on my bingo card for this year. We learned this past week that Nicolas Cage is set to star in a Spider-Man noir live action series for Amazon produced by Sony. The series is just going to be titled Noir, which seems like a strange omission of the name of Spider-Man. But basically, it looks like Nicolas Cage is going to play Peter Parker, the noir version of the character that he voiced in the Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse movie. The character basically is Spider-Man set in the 1930s Great Depression era. Of course, he wears all black. You know, he shoots guns. He still has organic webs and everything like that. But the stories are much more grounded and down to earth and very gritty. Uh, So it should be interesting to get this as a live action series. This is really bizarre to me. Like the character wasn't even in Across the Spider-Verse. 
Right. So I'm not sure why they're circling back to him. I don't know if it's just because of Nicolas Cage's name combined with Spider-Man or what? Yeah, it's strange because like they could have also developed series around any other number of Spider-Man characters that were in those films, such as like Spider-Punk or Silk, which actually, you know, she was going to have a show on Amazon that just got scrapped. I, I think it is a little bit strange to have someone like Nicolas Cage, who's, you know, not a spring chicken. He's kind of up there in age, but he'll be playing a superhero here. I'm guessing they're going to kind of tone down the super aspect and really up the noir aspect where he's going to be more of like an investigative reporter who just happens to have some spider related superpowers, you know? Right. Yeah. I'm wondering stylistically how this is going to go. Like, is it going to be more like the penguin or is it going to be more like Sin City? I hope it's like the latter. Well, uh, I would hope it's like the latter too. like just make it in black and white, kind of like how the Spider-Man war universe was depicted in into the Spider-Verse. Um, yeah. I think that'd be pretty cool. It's just going to be really weird to see a 60 year old Peter Parker. Yeah, that, that's very strange. Who knows? Maybe they'll like not even make him Peter Parker. It's bizarre in that Sony has the film and live action television rights to the character of Spider-Man. But of course, due to their deal with Marvel, they can't really make a movie starring Spider-Man set in their Sony Spider-Man universe. That's why we're getting movies like Venom and Madam Web and Morbius and stuff like that. This noir television series seems kind of like a workaround to include the Spider-Man character without still actually including him. Yeah, I have a feeling that if Nicolas Cage is playing Peter Parker, Kevin Feige probably has something to say about that. I wouldn't be surprised (laughs) if they renamed him. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised either. But that would be unfortunate because then, you know, they're going against the comics. And then at that point, why even make the show? But we'll see what happens. We'll see what they end up going with. The show is actually being a show run by Oren Uziel and Steve Lightfoot. Apparently, it's going to be executive produced by Phil Lord and Christopher Miller, the directors of the Into the Spider-Verse film, which is good news. We don't know when exactly the show is going to come out. It's currently in development, so it's probably still a year or two out. You have to imagine that Spider-Man Noir is probably going to make an appearance in Beyond the Spider-Verse then, just so that they have that synergy between, you know, what's in theaters and what's on your television screen. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Like, I think Noir will actually be a sequel to the character that we see in the Into the Spider-Verse films, where he's like older and down and out. It has the potential to be good, but also it's just strange. If Craven bombs, I'll be surprised if this even still happens, honestly. I just think... Sony's not quite knowing what to do. I don't know. I I think there's a big difference between their live action villain stuff and their Into the Spider-Verse stuff. I think this can move forward despite what happens with Kraven. And who knows, if this is a success, maybe we'll get like a Spider-Man India TV show and like a Spider-Punk TV show. Yeah, that would definitely be cool. Maybe like an anthology Spider-Man series where season to season we focus on a different Spider-Verse character. Live action. Sold. And I I, I don't really care for (laughs) Spider-Verse. You lost me on the last part of that sentence. So. <laughs> but that brings us to our question of the week. What celebrity voice actor for a Marvel or DC animated film would you like to see play the character in live action? So similar to how Nick Cage voiced Spider-Man Noir in the Into the Spider-Verse movie, he's now playing him in live action. What other voice actor do you want to see that happen with? Record your answer at dynamicduel.com by clicking on the red microphone button in the bottom right hand corner of the screen, which will prompt you to leave us a voicemail. Your message could be up to 30 seconds long, and don't forget to leave your name in case we include you on the podcast. We'll pick our favorite answer and award that person a Dynamic Duel no prize that we'll post to Instagram. Be sure to answer before May 23rd. We're recording the next episode a little bit early because of Memorial Day. In DC news, we learned this past week that DC Studios' second live-action film, Supergirl, Woman of Tomorrow, has landed a 2026 release date on June 26th. So it's going to be 62626. That's cool news. Hell yeah, it is. Hell yeah. What else is there to say about this? Well, I'll tell you. (laughs) It turns out that they were really interested in locking down a release date now that they have a director in Craig Gillespie. Now, he was rumored or in final talks to be the director of Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow for a few weeks now. But apparently the trades are reporting on the release date news like he actually is the director. So 
That's exciting news. Of course, Craig Gillespie is the director of prior films such as Cruella and I, Tanya. Both of those, I think, were great films. So it's pretty exciting to see that he will be directing Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow. Holy shit, that's a great get for a director. Hell yeah. That's actually really fascinating. His stuff tends to be a little bit dark, but from what I hear about the Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow storyline, it is a little dark. It is a little bit mature. It's 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 a departure from, I think, what we typically think of, you know, the lighthearted Supergirl fair is. Yeah, that project suddenly got a whole lot more interesting to me. I, I, would, I wasn't even sure what to think about it. I know that the Tom King series is highly praised. And with that kind of directing talent behind the camera in Craig Gillespie, this movie has a lot going for it. It seems like all of a sudden like Oscar worthy or something. It's weird. It's weird. (laughs) Well, there's been a lot of praise, not only about the graphic novel, but also the script adaptation written by Anna Noguera. Apparently it's phenomenal. And it seems like they've really fast tracked this storyline based off of her really great script. Initially, this film wasn't pitched as being the second film in the DC Studios universe, but now it is. You know, we got a director for Batman and Robin and Swamp Thing before we got the director for Supergirl. So I would have imagined that those projects would have gotten up and running prior to this, but apparently not. They just are in love with it. The film, of course, is going to star Millie Alcock in the lead role. Still not 100% sure about that casting, but everything else seems to be going off fairly well for this production. So it gets me excited. I'm not sure when they're going to start shooting this, but we'll see if the Millie Alcock Supergirl suit is anything like David Cornsweet's Superman suit. It should be. You would think that it would be. God, I hope not. Don't hate. (laughs) But I think that does it for all the news for this episode. So let's go ahead and get into our main event where we find out who would win in a fight between the android characters of Amazo and Bastion. Amazo versus Bastion. Uh, We have two highly adaptable androids here. They're basically just going to keep adapting to each other until one of them can no longer adapt. And then they just both explode. I I have no idea how it's going to go. It's going to be a very strange but interesting battle pitting these two characters against each other. Yeah, this specific battle was suggested, I believe, by our executive producer, Devin Davis, although he initially suggested Bastion versus Omac, which I loved, but we've also been trying to get Amazo into a duel for a while. Yeah, and we also thought that Omac might actually be a good matchup for Deathlock, um, so that'll be a duel likely in the future. Bastion is really cool, though, because to me, Bastion is the ultimate sentinel robot. In fact, in my history write up of the character that I'm going to get into in a short while here, I basically go over the entire history of the sentinels. He is kind of the culmination of everything the sentinels had been built for. Yeah, he's like the ultimate X-Men villain, and he's going up against the ultimate Justice League villain. Is Amazo the ultimate Justice League villain? I mean, when it comes to androids, I'll say yes. (laughs) But like how a sentinel can analyze and adapt against the mutant that they're fighting, a mezo can absorb the abilities of the people that he's fighting. That's right. And Joseph's not letting me start the match off with all of the powers of the Justice League because he's a big fat cheater. Right. I'm the cheater because I won't let you start off with all the powers of the Justice League. Right. OK. Yeah. All right. Yeah. To explain the methodology behind our duels, let's go to our sentient duel simulator, Alfred Jarvis 9000. AJ9K, tell our listeners how you go about determining a winner in our dual matchups. Yes, of course, sir. The way I determine a winner between the contestants is by running 1,000 Monte Carlo simulations using the character's statistics. A Monte Carlo simulation is a probabilistic model used to determine outcomes through random sampling. In this case, I randomize the statistics along a normal distribution as a way to simulate the many variables that can occur during battle. The stat parameters are based on the official Marvel power grid from which the DC character's statistics are extrapolated. Additional stat categories are included such as range, damage potential, versatility and perception in order to create a more detailed and accurate simulation. The results of the 1000 simulations provide a percentage of wins for each character. The contestant with the higher percentage is declared the victor as they have a higher probability to win any given battle. 
In an equitable pairing, neither character should win 100% of the matches. The comic book stories have shown that there's even a way for Batman to defeat Superman, so the confidence rate of my method falls in line with the precedents that have been established in the source material. My mathematical simulations are without subjectivity or bias. Feats are not the sole consideration, nor are fan votes tabulated for determination of the winner. Thanks, AJ9K. Before we run the simulations, though, we like to break down each character's histories and abilities before improvising a scenario on how we imagine one of the 1000 simulations would play out beat for beat. And I believe it's my turn to go first with the DC character's backstory, so let me tell you all about Amazo and his inventor. Now, Professor Anthony Ivo, the eventual creator of the android Amazo, grew up with severe thanatophobia, or the fear of death. Obsessed with avoiding death and achieving immortality, Ivo studied both cybernetics and genetics, eventually turning to criminal activities to fund his experiments. While working for a criminal organization known as Locus, Ivo was granted access to advanced alien technology and the cadavers of biologically adaptable aliens from the planet Apalax. Over time, Ivo developed the theory that by studying and experimenting on other species with long lifespans, he could create an immortality elixir and use it to achieve eternal life. To help with his plans, Ivo created Amazo, an android equipped with an absorption cell that Ivo reverse engineered from alien technology, which allowed Amazo to mimic the abilities of any superhuman it encountered. Amazo targeted the founding members of the Justice League and used their powers to steal animals required for Ivo's immortality elixir, which the scientists successfully created and consumed. The Justice League, however, realized that Amazo absorbed their weaknesses as well as their powers, allowing them to defeat both Amazo and his now immortal maker, Ivo, the latter of whom was punished with a 500-year prison sentence in case his immortality elixir actually worked. You can learn more about the Justice League and their team duel against the Avengers. Amazo, meanwhile, was kept in the Justice League headquarters trophy room, where it reawakened several times and battled the League before being shut down and put in storage once again. When the original Justice League team disbanded, a new, smaller team composed mostly of new recruits took their place, setting up their new headquarters in Detroit. Ivo escaped prison shortly before this and realized that his elixir did in fact work, though it also transformed his appearance, progressively disfiguring him over time. Driven insane by his predicament, Ivo created android duplicates of himself in his human form to care for him, though they ended up locking him up to protect him from his own increasing mental illness. Since Ivo blamed the Justice League for his appearance, the androids decided that they would destroy the newer, weaker League to please him. Though they managed to kill the hero Vibe, who you can learn more about in our Vibe vs. Miss America duel episode, the androids were later defeated, but not before they awoke Amazo, who also attacked the new League members, but was destroyed by the original members of Martian Manhunter and Aquaman. As Ivo's body continued to break down, he eventually wished for death and built an army of robots called Amazoids to kill him, though they were unable to do so. The Amazoids caught the attention of a new version of the Justice League, who managed to cure Ivo and return him back to his normal human state. Over time, however, Ivo succumbed to his fear of death and took his elixir once again, determined it was better to live forever as a monster than to die. Eventually, Ivo recreated an upgraded version of Amazo, who battled the Justice League on several occasions before being destroyed by Resurrection Man. Moments prior to his destruction, however, Amazo was summoned to the future by a time-controlling android from the 853rd century named Our Man, as he considered Amazo something of an ancestor since part of the technology within Our Man was based on Ivo's designs. You can learn more about Our Man in our Our Man vs. Bishop episode. Amazo copied Our Man's time-traveling powers, becoming Timezo, and wrecked havoc across <laughs> the timeline, though he was eventually captured and defeated by Our Man, who returned him back to his original time just before Amazo was destroyed. Initially, Amazo was only capable of mimicking one power at a time, but Ivo eventually created a version that contained all the powers of all Justice League members, 
This version of Amazo was nearly successful in destroying the League until, upon the Atom's suggestion, Superman disbanded the Justice League and rendered Amazo powerless, allowing the League to dismantle him. Batman and Nightwing later found a partially built Amazo in a weapon shipment and managed to destroy him. Ivo, meanwhile, in one of his experiments had managed to combine his absorption cell technology with human ova and DNA to create an android slash human hybrid version of Amazo, who was adopted and grew into a young man named Frank Halloran. Frank's powers awoke as a college student while he was with his girlfriend Sarah, and though he sought to become a hero named Kid Amazo, he eventually became mentally unstable after learning Sarah was actually Ivo's daughter, and he was later destroyed by Batman. When Ivo secretly installed the Amazo programming in the Android Justice League member Red Tornado, who you can learn more about in our Red Tornado vs. Sandman episode, Amazo was able to take over his body and ambush the League leading to an entire army of Red Tornado robots. The League was forced to destroy Red Tornado's body, and when they built a new one, Amazo took control of that one as well, forcing the League to teleport him into the gravity well of a distant star. In post-Flashpoint continuity, Professor Anthony Ivo was the head of Star Lab's Red Room project, which collected and studied the most dangerous technology encountered by the government. As a result of the project, Ivo was able to develop organic pattern processing technology that mimicked organic life down to the cellular level. This eventually led to the artificially intelligent A-Maze computer operating system, which eventually became corrupted and inhabited the body of an android from the Red Room, becoming Amazo, which learned from and adopted the Justice League's powers when it was attacked. Though Amazo was defeated, the Amazo system eventually infiltrated the League's satellite computer system, allowing it to build itself a new body on board the satellite, where it attacked and was defeated by Batman. After Amazo was defeated, Lex Luthor used the operating system programming to develop an organic Amazo virus that infected people and gave them superpowers. The first person treated for the virus, a LexCorp scientist named Armin Icarus, went insane and became the new Amazo. However, for this speculation, I will be going with the OS Android version of the character as the organic AI learning aspect makes more sense to me than the absorption cell. Powers wise, by default, Amazo is built with an extremely durable and strong robotic body and shell that houses an artificial intelligence capable of learning and mimicking the abilities, including superhuman, of those it encounters. And that's Amazo. These two characters are actually vastly similar, not just in their power sets, but also in their histories. And I think you'll find a lot of weird parallels in the Bastion backstory, even through the Sentinels and everything like that. Um, Wait, was there a time Bastion as well? (laughs) Kinda, but let me get into it. Now, to know the history of the X-Men villain Bastion is to first know the history of the Sentinel robots. Decades ago, a robotics expert named Bolivar Trask worked with the U.S. government to address the growing mutant population. Driven by a desire to protect humanity from mutants with dangerous abilities, Trask created a prototype robot called Mastermold, the very first Sentinel robot which was designed to create other Sentinels. The Sentinel robots were programmed to capture and exterminate mutant threats, which they did with frightening efficiency. However, Trask underestimated Master Mold's artificial intelligence, which deduced that in order to protect mankind, the Sentinels must also protect humanity from itself, and therefore destroy it. Trask then helped the X-Men blow up Master Mold and the Sentinel base, losing his life in the process. You can learn more about the X-Men in their team duel against the Titans. However, Trask's death did not stop Master Mold and the Sentinel program from resurrecting time and again, manifesting various kinds of Sentinels, including the 20-foot-tall Mark II Sentinels, the X-Sentinels, which were robotic replicas of the X-Men mutant heroes, and Wild Sentinels, which were as big as cities. No matter their form, Sentinels always posed one of the greatest threats to the X-Men and mutant kind throughout their history. This threat also extended decades into the future, where, in the Days of Future Past timeline, Sentinels took control over North America, 
killing most of the mutant population and turning the continent into a dystopian nightmare where only humans were permitted to breed. During this time, the most highly advanced sentinel prototype yet was created, which was named Nimrod. He was a scourge to the surviving mutants of the future, being highly adaptable, infinitely repairable, immensely powerful, and utterly unstoppable. At one point, he was pulled from the time stream and traveled from the future into the present time. While he initially posed a threat to the X-Men, over time, his advanced artificial mind began to develop emotions, and he discovered empathy, choosing to become a robot vigilante of sorts, protecting all life instead of eradicating mutants. This was short-lived, however, as Nimrod soon came into contact with the remnants of a circuit board belonging to Master Mold, which corrupted Nimrod's systems and set him on a mission of eliminating both mutants and humans. The Master Mold and Nimrod fusion proved to be unstoppable by the X-Men team, however Nimrod was able to assert dominance over the Master Mold intelligence, convincing it that in their synthesis they had become a mutant of sorts, and therefore must also be destroyed. Concurring, Master Mold self-destructed. Knowing that the fragments could recombine, the X-Men pushed the Nimrod Master Mold body into a transformative mystic gateway known as the Siege Perilous. The portal merged the two into a techno-organic cybernetic hybrid being, with no memory of who or what he previously was. He was found by a woman who adopted him as her surrogate son, giving him the new name Sebastian. He joined the Friends of Humanity anti-mutant group and used its political connections to gain influence and lead a new Pentagon-backed covert initiative known as Operation Zero Tolerance, which resurrected the Sentinel program. Sebastian, now just going by Bastion, developed nanotechnology which would infect humans with cybernetic implants, making them sleeper agents that, when activated, would be driven to detect and capture mutants. Calling these human cyborgs Prime Sentinels, Bastion used them to capture several X-Men and take over the Xavier Institute. Eventually, the X-Men defeated Bastion, revealing him as a cybernetic being, and Operation Zero Tolerance was shut down. Bastion was remanded into S.H.I.E.L.D. custody, where he escaped and tried to transform the android hero Machine Man into the Sentinel Supreme, though he was stopped by Cable whom you can learn more about in our Booster Gold vs. Cable Duel episode. Later, Bastion was decapitated by Wolverine, and his head was recovered by the US government to retrieve the information he had stolen from the Xavier Institute. Bastion's head was then stolen by the mutant-hating William Stryker, who attached it to the body of a Nimrod series sentinel, as Stryker had access to Nimrod's technology due to time travel. Back online, Bastion used his nanotech to control and resurrect some of the X-Men's greatest villains, including Donald Pierce of the Reavers, Graydon Creed, and Bolivar Trask himself, calling themselves the Human Council. Together, they tried to kill the mutant Hope Summers, who was the first mutant born after the Scarlet Witch had, for a time, erased the abilities of most of Earth's mutant population. Bastion erected a large dome force field over the X-Men's base and had his team target their teleporters like Nightcrawler so they couldn't escape the attack. Bastion then opened a portal to his home dimension, Days of Future Past, from where he summoned a fleet of Nimrod series sentinels to kill the X-Men. The Human Council was only defeated when the X-Men sent Cable and Cypher to the future to reprogram the Nimrod series sentinels and destroy the Nimrod Master Mold. Defeated, Bastion still tried to kill Hope Summers himself, though she destroyed him with a massive energy blast. Bastion managed to survive by escaping into the future, however, during the time of the war between the X-Men and the Inhumans. There, he started creating new Sentinels, however he was later apparently destroyed by the mutant Zorn, who swallowed him with the black hole inside his head. Powers-wise, Bastion is a techno-organic, cybernetic hybrid being with enhanced physicals such as strength, able to lift up to 25 tons, speed, and durability, basically indestructible. Using nanotechnology, he can transmute humans into techno-mechanical beings that he can control, and he has technopathy in the same manner. Bastion can technomorph both himself and any being he controls, including altering his mass and size, or giving himself wings or new appendages. This makes him self-repairable and highly adaptable, considering he can also detect and analyze the abilities of other beings and modify himself accordingly, like any sentinel. Or, not like any. 
and modify himself accordingly. Bastion can fire energy blasts and emit energy shields, and can open portals for teleportation or time travel. Finally, he has a genius level intellect, having a highly advanced calculating cybernetic mind. There you go. Cybernetic mind. Okay, cool. I have all of that down. Uh, Amazo has all of that too. <laughs> Including the uh, techno morphing? Well, I mean, if Bastion has it, yes. Oh, that's right. That's right. Okay. Shoot. Well, we're going to see how this goes. In a world where fantasies collide and heroes clash, one podcast network rises above the rest. Prepare yourself for the ultimate showdowns in comic books, video games, movies, and anime. The Dynamite Podcast Network presents Console Combat, where video game legends brawl every Monday. Dynamic Duel, where comic book titans smash every Tuesday. Max Destruction, where TV and action heroes battle every Wednesday. And Sendro World, where anime champions clash every Thursday. Join us as we speculate on the matches and, armed with the power of mathematical simulations, discover who will emerge victorious. Visit dynamicpodcast.com where we settle the debate and settle the score. Because now that we got their histories and abilities out of the way, let's speculate on how one of the 1,000 simulated matches will go. The winner is determined by simulations, not the speculation, but it's fun to imagine how this fight could play out. AG9K, AG9K, what are the rules of our speculation? Well, I should say there are no rules, other than the characters have no prior knowledge of the other going into the fight. All they are aware of starting out is that the other character is a threat that needs to be eliminated. For the speculation, the contestants will begin approximately 50 meters apart in a nondescript environment that will have no bearing on the match itself, as no environmental statistics are considered in my simulations. The contestants must earn victory on their own merit. All right, then, let's get into it. Amazo and Bastion meet on the battlefield. Who goes first? I'm going to say Bastion goes first because, like, it just seems like he has more personality than Amazo. That's so not true. He's going to analyze and scan Amazo like a sentinel would and determine his power set and the best course of action. Okay, I mean, of course, Amazo's own system is going to sense that it's being scanned and it's going to mimic that action, scanning Bastion as well. Okay, well, Bastion is going to generate these missile pods from his shoulders, and he's going to fire a pair of missiles at Amazo that just blow him up. Okay, except that, you know, once Amazo scans Bastion, he instantly learns everything Bastion could do, including shooting energy, which Amazo, he's going to do from his eyes like Superman to shoot down the missiles. And then he's just going to turn that laser vision toward Bastion himself and blast his head off. Okay, uh, energy shield. Bastion's going to throw up uh, like a pink glowing energy shield that blocks the lasers. And then he's going to technomorph from his back a pair of these razor sharp techno dragon wings kind of thing. And he's going to fly at Amazo with super speed. And he's going to plow his fist right into Amazo's face, just spinning his head 180 degrees. I mean, like, that's fine. Amazo, that doesn't bother him. His head is now backwards. Uh, <laughs> it's just going to make him angry. And with his sights still on Bastion, who, you know, flew past him, Amazo is going to technomorph a ring onto his hand that's going to glow with that pink energy. And having learned to create energy shields from Bastion, Amazo is going to create a like a crude pink energy construct of a giant hand that slams Bastion down into the ground and just flattening him. I see what you're doing here now. You're doing Justice yeah. League powers. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, uh, Bastion, he's going to grow in size to lift this hand off of him. He's going to lose the wings, but he's going to become like this 20 foot tall, kind of disproportionate, distorted figure. And he's going to manifest all of these like hoses from his back that kind of like snake around and point at Amazo and just like they all blast him with energy from like 10 different angles. Just pew, 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 pew. Okay, so Amazo, he gets tagged by like one or two of the lasers, we'll say, before he's just going to start moving, just like zipping around quickly by generating energy boosters on his heels and his back that just propel him forward like really fast. So Amazo, he's running zigzags around the environment before he runs behind Bastion and generates his own like hose cable thing 
that he's going to lasso around Bastion's neck and he's going to use his strength to yank him down to the ground real hard. Okay, well, uh, Bastion is going to shrink back down to normal size now. He's going to immediately get up off the ground. And uh, you done fucked up because Bastion is going to grab Amazo's lasso and he's going to transmit his Technovirus through it. And that's going to infect Amazo and turn him into Bastion's puppet match over. I mean, joke's on you. Because, like, as soon as Bastion starts to do that, suddenly this wing-shaped blade severs the lasso cord in half before the Technovirus could even reach Amazo. And Amazo's going to follow up immediately by throwing several more of those wing-shaped blades that embed themselves into Bastion's torso and upload their own Amazo S Technovirus into him, taking over Bastion's mind. You can't do... Amazo's so stupid. Anything that... Bastion does, Amazo's just doing back. That's right. Um, I'm going to say, though, that the exact opposite happens. I'm going to say that Bastion converts these Amazo batterings or whatever into small sentinel drones that look like uh, sentinels from the Matrix movie, like small wild sentinels. Okay. Okay. And they're fully under Bastion's control. Bastion is going to send them out to surround Amazo and these sentinels are going to like wrap him up in their tentacles and they're going to overload him with energy that just blow him up to pieces with just like nuts and bolts flying everywhere. Wait, how the heck did a few batterings turn into like a swarm of flying sentinel drones? Technomorphing, man. And it's not like a swarm. It's, it's only like three or four or whatever. In fact, w- where did Amazo even get the batterings from? If we're asking questions like that. Uh, I, I don't even know. Like, where did... Bastion get his wings from again technomorphing you know he, he just used some of the mass from his back he's a dense dude you know he can make wings out of his back so is that how he grew in size earlier he just like expanded his dense volume uh like I pictured it as more of like a disproportionate growth he was only using the mass he had available to grow to 20 feet tall so I kind of pictured him as like this robot slender man with like cables coming out of his back firing lasers Ah, that's creepy. Yeah, he can get pretty creepy looking sometimes. Okay, okay, so Amazo is getting overloaded by these drones, but he's also working at assimilating these drones back onto his side, which he does, and they're going to, like, drill into the ground and form the frame of this crazy-looking wild sentinel made of metal cables and earth that looks like a giant lobster squid. And it just erupts from the ground and falls on Bastion and devours him, destroying his technology and bringing an end to this match. He summoned the Kraken. Okay. (laughs) Except that as the techno squid creature or whatever is about to land on Bastion, he's going to open a portal above him into the Days of Future Past timeline. And the creature and Amazo, they're both going to get pulled into this time portal and they just get their asses handed to him by a legion of Nimrod series sentinels. Dang. Okay. Well, I mean, if time play is an issue now, Amazo is just going to generate his own time portal while he's in the days of future past. And he's going to go all the way to the 853rd century where he's going to once again become time Azo. And he's just going to travel all throughout time, acquiring all of the powers of every DC character ever. And he's going to return back to the days of future past and just beat the shit out of those Nimrods. After which he's going to go back to where Bastion is and just beat the shit out of him. Ending this match for real this time. Okay. Um, I'm going to say, though, that Bastion was quicker with his time travel. And he already went and turned all the DC heroes into his personal Sentinel army. So Time Mazo becomes Die Mazo. I don't know. Dead Mazo? Whatever. (laughs) Match is over. How are you going to be faster with time travel, though? Easy. Time travel. There's your answer. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I guess we'll leave it there. Either Amazo acquires all of the powers of every DC hero ever using time travel and uses it to destroy Bastion or Bastion uses time travel to assimilate every DC hero into a prime sentinel. Why has it got to be the DC heroes? Why can't you go to your own universe? Uh, Sure. You can do it to Marvel too. The human ones, at least. But yeah, we'll leave it there. We'll input the character stats. We'll run the simulations and find out which of these ending scenarios happens when we come back with a winner. AG9K, hit it. Inputting data, running calculations, 
Processing results. Simulations complete. Okay, so it was a huge challenge coming up with Amazo's stats, considering the fact that there's so many different versions of this character. Like, you have one guy who could take on the entire Justice League, and you have another version that can be defeated by Batman. Yeah, so what we decided in the end was to kind of average the Justice League-powered version of Amazo with what we call the base model Amazo, which is pretty still damn powerful. But at that level, we got a character who was pretty on par with Bastion. Because, like, the Justice League Amazo is going to be way too powerful for Bastion, but the base model is not nearly powerful enough. Right, yeah. We said that Amazo came out on top in terms of speed and strength, and fighting, surprisingly. Amazo is much more of a brawler than Bastion. Yeah. Bastion, however, came out ahead in terms of durability, uh, considering, like, he could get his head blown off and reconstitute himself. He's, like, infinitely repairable. Bastion also got the edge in intellect, because Amazo is a big dum-dum for a robot, (laughs) which is kind of surprising. And then Bastion also came out ahead on versatility, which, that seems weird, right? Yeah, and that was a result simply of the averaging that we did between Amazo's most powerful form and his base form. Interestingly enough, Bastion came out a little bit ahead on that. Yeah, because base level Amazo doesn't really do a whole lot. Like he can fly and punch things and shoot lasers from his eyes, but not too much else. Right, yeah. So taking all of this into consideration, who do you think came out on top? I'm going to give it to my boy Bastion for sure. Well, Instagram disagrees with you because 70% of them said that Amazo was going to win. And I feel like I'm on this like DC hot streak when it comes to Instagram. Like the past like five or six polls have all gone in DC's favor, which I feel like had been really rare in the past. Yeah, I think consistently Marvel characters usually get the win in those polls. So, yeah, I don't know what's happening. It feels like the tide of public opinion is kind of turning against Marvel, which I don't like. Like Marvel fans... Let's represent ourselves in these polls, but also be honest, you know, with who you think will win. Obviously, Marvel characters. Well, let's see if that's true. AJ9K, the results, please. Here you are, sir. The winner of the matchup between Amazo and Bastion is Bastion. He won 552 of the 1000 matches or 55.2% compared to Amazo's 44.8% win rate. I feel like that makes sense. Really, Bastion would just turn Amazo into a Sentinel. For as powerful as Amazo is and his whole adapting ability, at the end of the day, he's made out of technology that Bastion can just manipulate. But that that doesn't make sense to me as, as reasoning why he would win, because Amazo could just do the same thing to Bastion if they're, you know, going toe to toe against each other. Ultimately, I think it really comes down to intelligence, because would Amazo think to do that before Bastion would? And I'm not quite sure he would. Overall, though, this was pretty close. So, I mean, who's to say? I'm really glad we went with Bastion for this matchup. I think initially I wanted to do Nimrod, the Sentinel from Days of Future Past who is my favorite Sentinel. But Devin Davis, one of the executive producers, was like, now it should be Bastion, not only because he's a major villain in the X-Men 97 animated series, but also, you know, Nimrod becomes Bastion. So Bastion is kind of like the final form of the Sentinel robot. And everybody loves the Sentinels. I thought this was a great match. Well, I thought it sucked. (laughs) You wanted to go with the Mark II Sentinel robots, right? I wanted to go with the Justice League Amazo. Dude is hella powerful. Way more powerful than Bastion could ever be. And I don't know, this this loss just makes me feel dirty. It makes me feel like Bastion could defeat the Justice League, which I know he can't. I mean, if the Justice League were all robots, you know, he'd have a pretty damn good chance of taking them oh, over. So he has no chance then, because none of them are <laughs> robots. Well, maybe Cyborg. Hmm. I don't know. I mean, Cyborg has technopathy too, so. That's true. That's true. But that does it for this duel, guys. Let us know what you thought about the results by writing to us at dynamicduelpodcast at gmail.com or by visiting us on Instagram, which you can find a link to in our show notes, or by going to our website at dynamicduel.com. And on our site, you could also find a link to our Patreon page where you could join our Dynamic 2 tier and chat with us and fellow listeners, our Fantastic Four tier, which gets you bonus content each month, our X-Force tier that makes you an executive producer of this podcast, 
or our newest tier that lets you join our Dynamite Podcast Network. And guys, please don't forget to rate our show either on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify or Podchaser or even on our website. In our next episode, we are going to be reviewing X-Men 97, the Disney Plus animated series, 10 episodes. Uh, if you haven't checked it out yet, definitely go watch it, especially if you're a fan of the 90s X-Men animated cartoon. Even if you weren't, it's fantastic. I haven't even started it yet, so I'm going to be doing some big. You better get on that shit. I know. <laughs> but that is it for this episode, guys. We want to give a big thanks to our executive producers, Ken Johnson, John Starosky, Zachary Hepburn, Dustin Belcom, Mickey Matangian, Brandon Essergard, Nathaniel Wagner, Levi Yaton, Austin Wisolowski, AJ Dunkerley, Scott Camacho, Gil Camacho, Adam Spees, Andrew Schunk, Dean Molesky, and Devin Davis for helping make this podcast possible. And we'll talk to you guys next week. Up, up, and away. True believers. You mean AI can take over the world? Total mind blow.